to order the City of Revere Beach City Council workshop on the compensation and pay study to order. Madam Clerk, roll call, please. Mayor Thomas Masters. Present. Chairperson Tanya Davis Johnson. Here. Chair Pro Tem Lynn L. Hubbard. Here. Councilperson Kashama L. Miller Anderson. Present. This, Councilperson Julia A. Botel. Here. Councilperson Terrence T.D. Davis. Here. City Manager Karen Hoskins. Here. Interim Assistant City Manager Willie Horton. Here. Deputy City Clerk Jacqueline Burgess is present. City Attorney Andrew DeGraff and Wright. You have a call. Thank you. Oh. I'd like for us to stand for a moment of silence followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Councilwoman Botel. Before we begin, I need to make a statement that due to technical difficulties, live streaming and live viewing of this meeting will not take place. Uh, should the cable be restored, the meeting will be shown as the cable is restored. Thank you. Madam City Manager. Good evening, Madam Chair and City Council members. During the May 5th, 2017 City Council meeting, the council awarded a contract for the purpose of a citywide compensation and pay study. This contract was awarded to management advisory group. The purpose of the study was to, to develop a pay plan that is fair, equitable, with both public and private employers in the surrounding geographic market area from which the city recruits in order to attract, motivate, and retain quality employees. The services also included providing an impl implementation plan that included options for a phase-in approach extending over a two-year budget cycle, evaluating current job classifications, number of job classifications, including additions, deletions, and or consolidations. The purpose of the study also was to analyze current job description format and to be compliant with all app applicable state and federal laws. <coughs> At this time, we have the management advisory group here, uh, Mr. Russell Campbell and Mrs. Carolyn Long to give a presentation regarding the study. And you also have in your packets the various uh, managerial employees' uh, implementation plans that were ran. At this time, Mr. Campbell. Uh, good evening, Mr. Mayor, uh, fellow commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to come back to the great city of Rivera Beach to uh, discuss the compensation classification study that we prepared on behalf of the city. What I thought would be appropriate would be kind of to back up and kind of take you to through a chronological timeline of when we started, what the activities were along the way, and what brought us to the end of the process in terms of the results and recommendations going forward. As I go through, please feel free to ask questions um, at any juncture during the presentation. One moment, looks like we got a little technical difficulty here. Madam Chair. I, so this PowerPoint is pretty much the same one we saw in February? Uh, there's some additional, uh, additional information at the end. been added. I just want to make sure everybody is cognizant okay. of the initial information that was shared, and then I'll bring it to present day today okay. to talk about the specifics. Just briefly, uh, we've been in business since 2002. We are headquartered in uh, Woodbridge, Virginia. We've got multiple offices on the East Coast. 
I am the partner in charge of the Columbia, South Carolina office. With me today is Ms. Carolyn Long, who's our executive vice president, and she splits her time between the corporate office and the regional office in Spartanburg, South Carolina. There were a number of people from the company that worked on the project. I am the one who's probably spent the most time uh, on site. Uh, in addition to myself, there was Mr. Jim Britton, uh, there was uh, Mr. Steve Foster, uh, Ms. Carolyn Long served as technical advisor, and I, of course, was the project director. Anytime you do a compensation and classification study, expectation of all those that are involved tend to rise as we're talking about pocketbook issues, money, and so there's a lot of expectations to the outcome of the study. So it's incumbent upon the consultant and the company doing the study to make sure that we clearly articulate what the study will address and what it will not address. And so we held a series of meetings around the city where all the employees were invited to attend one of those one-hour briefings so that they would be given a briefing of the overview of the study, the process, and their role in terms of providing information to the consulting team. We also shared with them that this was not a staffing study. We were not looking to determine whether or not departments were properly uh, staffed or overstaffed. Uh, we were not looking to restructure or realign any functions in any particular department, and we were not here to assess performance or capabilities of any individual employee. We did say that <clears throat> although s some pay raises will be recommended as a result of the study, we did not guarantee that every employee in the city would receive a pay raise. The only one guarantee that we did make was that we would never make any recommendations to cut or reduce anyone's salary as it relates to this process. The scope of the project, at the time of the study, the city had 172 different job classifications or titles. Approximately 475 employees were subject to the scope of the project. We were looking at the internal relationship of the jobs to make sure we ranked them accordingly based on duties and responsibilities. Secondly, we wanted to access the external market to make sure that the salary structure that we developed was competitive and allowed the city to compete with the surrounding jurisdictions for competent, qualified labor. And we wanted to uh, create a process where once the study was done, the city could administer it fairly, equitably, and would not have to go through a process of this type probably for another five or six years. As a point of best practices, we generally ask or encourage uh, the clients to uh, take a look at everything every five or six years. We provided the same software that we used to build the study. We provided it to the city, uh, licensed it to the city at no additional cost, and we did provide training to uh, the HR staff uh, on how the software worked and so that if there were any uh, adjustments or reclassification requests that were to come about after we were done, the capability did rest in-house to uh, handle those reclassification requests. Madam Chair. <coughs> Thank you. He, you said that as you go along and we have questions. Yes, sir. Feel free to sure. ask them then rather than wait. So I'm taking advantage of your, your request All right. or your, or your statement. I want to go back to which just that one. Com with other comparable agencies, describe that <coughs> in detail to me. What, what does that mean? Generally, when we talk about comparable organizations or target uh, organizations, we're looking and talking about organizations that you compete with head-to-head uh, -head for the same type of skill set and employee. And so being geographically in an urban area, there are a number of municipal, uh, county, as well as school district entities that you compete with uh, for labor. There are also some private sector organizations that utilize some of the same skill sets that you do here in the city. IT people work across public and private lines, uh, administrative staff, uh, technical staff. And so first thing we wanted to do was assess within a radius of 200 miles what are the uh, major employers within that radius. And so we came up with a list, which I will show you uh, and share with you shortly, of employers that we thought were competitors of the city. We asked the city to provide some feedback uh, in terms of their thoughts on our, our list. And we made some adjustments, and we mutually agreed to a list 
of about 12 target organizations that we would collect wage and salary information from as well. When you looked process. at the comparable agencies, did you take into account the population of the other uh, uh, we did not. agencies? We did not. We were, we were strictly looking at uh, comparable jobs, making sure that we matched apples to apples, and then the pay range of those positions from the competing organizations. So whether it was a job in West Palm Beach or Riviera Beach, it was still yes comparable. Yes, even though the city is ten times larger, whatever. Okay, thank yes. you. I have a question, Madam Chair. Councilwoman Miller, Anderson, recognize. Uh, yes, ma'am. Along those same lines, so you only looked at the actual job title. Did you look at the um, job description? Uh, you said you didn't what, look at the population. Mm -hmm. What about the education? If I could, job experience. I could interject. What we do is we will take the uh, class specifications that exist within the organization, we will prepare a narrative on the specific duties of the position, the education, experience, and other qualifications needed for the job, prepare that in a survey format, and send that to the survey target organizations and asking them to review the narrative of the position that exists within Rivera Beach and to identify a comparable position in their organization if one exists. Sometimes there are not matches, but the majority of the time, we're going to have matches for about 90 plus percent. So of you the say positions. you will do it, or is we that did. what you all did? We did. Okay, so with so basically you did look at that information and you took that into consideration. Yes, and that was a part of your formula. That's part of the process. But the population, um, the amount of employees that they have, the amount of service that they're putting out. That will not matter from the per uh, perspective of an employee. Uh, if I'm making $40,000 a year here at the city of Rivera Beach as an IT technician and, the Palm, and Palm Beach County, which is a lot larger, uh, has the same position and they're offering me a $15,000 pay raise, I, I, it does not matter how big they are or how many people they have. Well, it's, it's strictly looking at the job, the nature of the job, and its availability in the, in the labor market. But I would disagree with that because more than likely they have more work to do or, the, I mean, it's... That's why the job pays more. Right. So, but that doesn't say that that $40,000 would be perfect for this city because it depends on the amount of work that's being done, depends on how many other employees are, are sharing the job responsibility. Um, Th those things can be assessed, but at our level... We, we don't get down in the weeds to do that type of detail because those things are going to vary from organization to organization. What employees care about is the value in terms of pay, how they're going to be remunerated for the job that they do for the city. And so I've been doing this for 20 years, and I've done it around the country, some very sophisticated places, some very rural places. What is important is people want to make sure that when they look around the region, at city of uh, West Palm, Palm Beach County, uh, any school district, any of the other jurisdictions that their pay is competitive. Competitive does not mean that they make dollar for dollar with the larger jurisdictions. What it means is the pay range and the pay system within this organization is broad enough based on the experience and education of individuals that are applicants, the city can negotiate a starting salary that will bring that type of talent into the organization. I've assessed morale and climate in a, a 150 different organizations over the years. When you rank the top five reasons why someone comes to work for an organization, pay does not always come out to be number one. It's always in the top three. Sometimes number one is security, job security. Uh, sometimes number one is opportunities for advancement, professional development. Sometimes uh, the leadership that they're exposed to. Uh, is, is another factor that may rise to number one. So there are a multitude of issues or, or, or characteristics that may decide whether one decides to come work for an organization or not. Too many to try to value in a study of this type. So we keep it simple, we keep it focused, we keep it comparable, and we're looking at the value of the positions in the marketplace, a snapshot at this point uh, in time. 
Okay, and I'll, I'll come back once you bring the list up of okay. the municipal. Madam Chair, I, I just have a follow on, if I may. Councilwoman Botel, you, you recognize. I, I can understand your saying that with regard to certain positions, like an IT job is an IT job. I work for Apple Computer. I met a lot of IT technicians in my time. And, you know, you have a specific set of skills that you do and so forth. But if, for example, I'm an HR person and I was in HR for a while in a school district, and I have 475 employees in my charge, um, and I'm getting a certain amount of money f to do that job, w but uh, then I'm in uh, the city of West Palm Beach and maybe I have 1,500. Do you not see that there's a difference in those jobs? We're talking about volume? Yeah, volume, exactly. Quantity of work? Quantity of work. Sure, yeah. there are probably going to be differences. So you didn't take any of that into consideration? No. Because that's not going to be, w when the job is posted and advertised, they're not going to provide any statistics on the workload. They're going to say, here's the duties and responsibilities, here are the qualifications, here's the experience that we need. You either apply for the job or not. That they're not going to provide you with uh, work statistics because that's not going to matter if the salary is competitive and, and where one needs it to be. Madam Chair. I, well, I understand. I understand that he asked if, if we could allow him to move forward and ho hold our questions. I'm okay with that. Okay. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. And in terms of the project team, I, I think it's important to uh, share from the city's perspective uh, who made up the project team. As I said, I was the MAG representative. I served as a project manager. I was the day-to-day -day contact uh, with the city, uh, primarily through the Human Resources Department. Uh, for any information and all exchanges of information. A uh, part of the project team on behalf of the city, uh, initially, as you see down at the bottom, I note uh, Mr. Jonathan Evans, the former city manager. Uh, he was a part of the team initially, and so was Mr. Bruce Davis, the former HR director, uh, who are no longer with the city. Uh, after those two individuals left employment with the city, uh, Ms. Karen Hoskins was <coughs> on the project team, uh, Mr. Randy Sherman, finance director, Ms. Eureka Irvin, Interim HR Director, and Ms. Shavana uh, Booker, HR Administrator. Uh, those individuals, along with myself, are the ones who reviewed the initial uh, drafts as I prepared them, uh, as I responded to questions and concerns raised from the drafts uh, from the team. Uh, we would sit down and we would meet uh, primarily face-to-face -face in the conference room over in, uh, here in City Hall or HR to discuss any areas of concern or any areas that, I, that the committee thought I needed to go back and do a double check or, or take a double look at. Um, and so we also had numerous uh, uh, phone calls back and forth, emails back and forth uh, to put the study together. We've been working on this uh, for well over 10 months from the time we started. Uh, and uh, we did bring it to a, a close uh, in April. Um, final report. When we started collecting information in terms of what the employees of the city of River Air Beach were doing, we had to utilize an instrument that was universal in that it would ap be applicable to any position or any individual in the organization. And we call that our job analysis questionnaire, or JAQ. Every employee who attended the one-hour briefing was given specific instructions on how to access our server online to complete that questionnaire. Typically, it takes about an hour to do that questionnaire. We gave them two weeks to do an hour's worth of work, and then we gave supervisors a week to review the information that was submitted by the employees, but the supervisors had review access only. They could not change or alter anything that the employees originally submitted. If there was a difference of opinion or perspective, the supervisor was to note that, and then in our system, those comments are red flag, and then we will come back through our point of contact uh, in HR to weed through any issues where there seems to be differences between what uh, an employee says he or she does and what the supervisor uh, sees as the responsibilities for the position. We look at the employees as the uh, resident experts in their field and the uh, supervisors as the uh, uh, leaders of those respective departments, as the ultimate custodians of the activities that take place uh, in those departments. 
This is a snapshot of the website. They were instructed to log in, www.maginc.org, to complete those uh, questionnaires. We provided weekly status updates on uh, how many people had completed the questionnaires, how many had started but not completed, how many questionnaires had been reviewed and signed off on by supervisors, so that there was a, an up-to-date listing of where we are in terms of the number of people that participated in terms of completing the questionnaire. Typically, we go into an organization where we hope to gather at least uh, a, a 75 to 80 percent participation rate. We were about at 74.5 percent uh, on this particular project, so we were right in line basically where we want to be in terms of participation uh, of the number of people that complete the questionnaire. Uh, supervisors and department heads, we did one-on-one -on -one interviews to sit down to discuss any specific issues relative to their, their department any recruitment difficulties, retention issues, uh, any pending reclassification requests that they were made aware that was going to be approved, uh, new positions that uh, they wanted to make sure that were going to be added to the study. I know Development Services had a number of new positions that uh, the, the Commission approved, and so we went back and added those positions in the study as well. <coughs> when we looked at that questionnaire, we were specifically looking at 14 job factors or 14 elements that we use to grade and rank the positions within the organization. We look at everything from the data that the employees worked with, how they exercise judgment, uh, people responsibility in terms of coordinating relationships or supervision, complexity of their work, any asset responsibility, whether it be equipment or funds, uh, impact of decisions, uh, the ramifications of uh, bad decisions, what's the impact to the city and the individual. We looked at the education that's needed for the position, the experience needed, any particular equipment that is being utilized, as well as any physical requirements, communication, mathematical development, uh, and unavoidable hazards and safety of others. As a consultant, I will go through, and I did go through each and every one of those job questionnaires, and I'll sign a rating based on the relationship between the job dues and responsibilities in the questionnaire and our uh, job factors or job elements. As I do that, our software accumulates uh, the uh, point total for each position, and then it establishes a rank order where we'll have the least complex or lowest scoring job in the organization based on our criteria and ascending order all the way up to the most complex uh, position within the organization. Now, you don't have to be a consultant to walk into a particular organization and figure out uh, what's going to be considered the most complex or the top job. That's typically someone who's running the organization. And you don't have to be uh, particularly versed in compensation analysis to figure out uh, what's, what's going to be the least complex position. Usually you're talking about uh, courier, mail clerk, custodial position. But it's how all those other jobs uh, in the middle shake out that you need a process that can be validated uh, from a uh, quantitative standpoint and, and be defensible uh, should uh, the need arise to uh, defend the uh, results. This is a software that we use to prepare the analysis and do the study. Uh, it is also the same software that we have licensed to the city as a part of this process. <coughs> now when we do the market survey, we do not do a market survey on every position. We do do a job analysis or evaluation on every position. We take a random sample of about 20% of the overall job titles in the organization. We make sure we have a cross-section of positions from throughout the city. We make sure we have some clerical positions, technical, skill, craft, middle management, upper management, executives, uh, public safety, uh, uh, mechanical. And those positions are put on the uh, survey list with very detailed narratives with regard to what those jobs encompass and entail, as well as the qualifications needed for those uh, particular positions. And those are some additional benchmarks that were uh, used. And then targets. We kind of briefly talked about that in the beginning. But these are the organizations that were mutually agreed upon by MAG and the city uh, to contact, uh, to gather wage and salary data. Town of Palm Beach, City of West Palm, City of Delray Beach, Boynton, Palm Beach County, Palm Beach County Schools, City of Boca, City of Palm Beach Gardens, City of Wellington, Town of Jupiter, Jupiter 
and Seacoast Utilities. We got responses from everyone except for Seacoast Utilities. Uh, I personally made five phone calls and sent three emails uh, and left uh, at least three voicemails with the HR contact there and she chose not to respond or return my calls. One of the things we do as a part of this process because we know there are some positions in the organization that do exist in the private sector. Once we've compiled the data from the public sector organizations, we do go back and do some comparative analysis to see what comparable jobs that may exist in the private sector, what are they being paid, and we use the Federal Department of Labor's Bureau of Labor St uh, Statistics uh, data for the, uh, for the regional area in which our client resides. So we looked uh, at the south, south, southern portion of Florida, the southeast portion of Florida, uh, to see what was being paid for comparable jobs that exist uh, in the private sector. Just to recap on the process, and this is not unique to, to management advisory group. Any company that's in the compensation analysis business, they've got to do two things. Number one, they've got to address the internal relationship of the jobs. We call that internal equity. Uh, secondly, they've got to address external equity by looking out in the marketplace to see what wages are being paid from a competitive standpoint. And then they've got to use some type of st statistical calculation or method to bring together those two sets of data. We use linear regression, basic statistical modeling done by a computer. Once we enter in the job points for all the positions as that have been graded, we enter in the market data, and then the computer will then project or <coughs> recommend a salary range and pay grade for each one of the positions that are in the study. Then we have a technical review internally uh, among our staff. Then we uh, uh, meet with the client, have an initial meeting to review the draft and give them uh, a couple of weeks to review it, get some feedback, and then we go through the process of making adjustments as needed. Um, once we responded to the initial round of uh, questions from uh, the committee and HR, uh, the HR department then met with department heads to show and discuss how their particular departments came out or fared in a particular study and again, document any questions or concerns that they may have, which were then routed back to uh, MAG and, and me as the project manager. <laughs> now, when we put the study together, we, in a sense, put together three plans within one. We had a public safety plan, and then we had a general plan, and we had a managerial plan. Public safety, thank you. Obviously, we're talking about uh, police and fire. Uh, general was any position that was not considered managerial and we had the managerial plan. It appears that a lot of the concern or confusion rests with the managerial implementation plan and so that's what that's the one I'd like to focus in on um, as it relates to uh, my presentation this evening. Now the managerial implementation plan and I want to be clear here because <clears throat> there's, it's been brought to my attention, there's been a little bit of confusion. Once the base study is put together, once we've come up with the value in terms of salary ranges and grades for the jobs, the next step is to come up with an implementation model to transition current employees into the new plan, into the new structure. This is where the client drives the train based on their philosophy and their fiscal resources in terms of implementing the study. And so we can run multiple implementation models with corresponding cost impact uh, to achieve whatever end result the organization is looking to achieve. So as we started talking about implementation, one of the first calculations we made was to identify each and every employee by department whose current salary was below the entry level of the proposed grade and range that we had assigned them to. There were people across the organization who were below those entry level salaries. So we had to calculate what it was gonna take to bring them up at least to that level. And then from there, there were some objectives that, <clears throat> based on conversations with the committee and the RFP, that needed to be met. The city has a problem that we define as salary compression. What is salary compression? Salary compression defined is when you have large numbers of employees in the same uh, grade 
but different years of tenure all clustered toward the bottom end of the pay scale. They're, they're compressed down at the lower end. That is not unusual if you go into an organization that does not have some type of performance or merit pay program to augment their general cost of living increases. If all you're giving is a general cost of living increase, let's say 3%, and then you're adjusting the pay ranges by 3%, guess what? If I was at, 20, if I was at the lower 25% quartile, at when you started that calculation, I'm going to be there when you finish it because you move the range 3% and you move me 3%. I didn't go forward within my salary range. Remember, a salary range is defined by a minimum, which is entry level, midpoint, which is our market, which is the average for individuals in that occupational group, and then the maximum, which is the top end value, and we've been able to define it at this point in time for that job. And so if we broke that down, when we look out in the marketplace, probably two-thirds of the people in any occupational group are going to be making somewhere around that market point. Probably 13 to 15 percent are going to be around that entry level, and then the remaining 16, 17 percent are going to be somewhere up around uh, the maximum of the respective salary range. And so one of the objectives was compression, and the other was to make sure that the organization was competitive in the marketplace because the organization has not been aggressive in, a, in the past few years in terms of managing salaries. I don't think you've implemented pay for performance in, in, in recent times uh, or merit pay. I think primarily it's been, uh, for the non-bargaining units, has been uh, general cost of living increases. So in order to address the compression and market competitive issue, we came up with over a dozen different implementation models that we ran cost projections on. Based upon the committee's decision, we ran what we call a 5 and 10 implementation model as one of the dozen. And that particular implementation model was the one that was selected uh, by the committee uh, to use for the managerial staff. Now for the general staff, we used a 10 and 20 model. And I'm going to show you the cost effect of going from a 10 and 20 to a 5 and 10 and define what those mean. So on the 5 and 10, we're, we're, we're programming the computer to say any employee who's been in their current position at least five years, they're going to be brought to the market point or midpoint of their pay range. Any employee who's been in their current position for 10 years, they're going to, oh, sorry, they're going to be moved up toward the maximum of their respective uh, salary range. Now, if we look at the general, it was 10 and 20. Any employee who's been in their current position 10 years would go to the market point or midpoint. Any employee who's been in their position 20 years would go toward the maximum. And so those are two different implementation set, ma'am? The next slide. Okay. It's the next slide. Okay. And the next one shows the uh, uh, implementation formula that was done for the general population. So what I did was I applied the same 1020 as well as the 510 to the uh, managerial group, and the results were different. When we did the 5 and 10 model, 5 years to market average, uh, 10 years to toward the maximum, the total cost just for the managerial, which was 43 positions, was $378,240. Now, when I ran it a second time, based on the 10 and 20 model for managerial, you can see the cost was almost cut in half because we, ex we extended the time it would take to get to the market average and to the, and to the maximum. Now, as a project director, my job is not to dictate which implementation model the client chooses to go with, but it is to advise as to what I would consider to be the optimum implementation model. I advise the city to go with the 10 and 20 model for both the general population as well as the managerial staff. And the, the committee opted not to do that. They opted to go with the more aggressive approach. And so I pulled out individuals that, <clears throat> based on the 5 and 10 model, that had the biggest percentage adjustments as it relates to the study. 
And so I'm not going to use full names. I'll just use first initial and last name. Uh, for example, C. Cobb, that particular individual, at the time we started the study, their original base pay was 98905 And you'll notice there's an asterisk by that. Down at the bottom, there's a footnote that says that original salary also includes their longevity pay. So their base pay and their longevity pay was <coughs> calculated together. And for that individual, it was 98905 Running the 510 model of implementation, that person's salary went from 98905 to 133577 If we chose the 1020 implementation model, that salary would have went from 98905 to 106831 And so this is where we see the distinctions in, in terms of where, we, where there were some significant individual adjustments as it relates to the study. And remember, the formula to implement based upon tenure and current position is impacted by the longevity of the individuals in those positions. You have some people that have been in the same position for, for, for decades. Uh, and that is the driver of those equity adjustments to stagger them within the pay range to address the compression issue. Now you'll notice that there's one person that has a double asterisk, F. Scott. Well, when we ran the 510 initially, uh, the projected salary was to be 110, excuse me, 118,537. What we subsequently found out was her, her promotion date into that position was wrong. And so we went back and we, we ran that uh, uh, based on the correct promotion date. And at the bottom you'll see there, promotion update, the 510 salary, uh, and what, well, actually what she's going to be making proposed now is 95677. And so we went back and corrected that. Now because, and if you recall, when I first came here under recommendations, I talked about updating policies. And one of the things I said that was a bullet item, you need to get a modern human resources information system. The staff had to do a lot of manual going through personnel files trying to figure out what date employees assume their current positions. Some of that information hadn't been updated in years. And so there were dozens of cases where we had to go back and update individuals' promotion date into their existing position. And that had an impact uh, on the cost. But just point out another one here. Uh, let's, let's talk about Ms. Irving. Uh, the original base salary at the time of the study was 65155 uh, The recommendation based on the 510 model would have moved her to 110 220 and the 1020 model would have moved her salary to 88000 Now, Ms. Uh, Irving, based on her dues and responsibilities, I recommended that the city consider reclassing her to the assistant HR director. Not the director, but the assistant HR director. And subsequently, she has decided that she does not want that role and has voluntarily stepped back. And you will see under the 1020 model, uh, where her salary would be, it would be at the $88,000 uh, mark. Madam Chair. Councilwoman Patel, you recognize. So how and by whom was it decided to use this 510 as opposed to the 1020 that you recommended? And a second question. Uh -huh. Does it not strike you as having the appearance of impropriety that two people who were on the project team also were two people who received these salaries? I submitted a email, written email, voicing my concern about the large increase and the impact they may have on morale within the organization. Uh, and the committee was made aware of that. Uh, the most vocal individual in terms of moving and pushing that 510 was the finance director, uh, who assured us that the funds were there to implement 510. And uh, that was the. Uh, no one else on the committee voiced an objection, and so that was the implementation model that went with. It is not my role to dictate policy, and so I advise against it, but at the end of the day, I'm working for the organization. Madam Chair. Mr. Mayor, you recognize? The email that you sent yes, to the city 
you still have a copy of it, right? Uh, we do. I like to, I like to see it. I like to have it. Um, I want to ask you a, a few things. The um, you've been in this field for twenty twenty years. Ex you've had twenty years experience. Started in, in this field in nineteen ninety five. What are the qualifications? Are are there any? Well, I know there are, but um, any credentials that are necessary to to do this? I am a compensation analyst. I have done over 175 of these studies. Uh, right now, I'm doing a similar project for DeKalb County Schools, which has uh, 105,000 students and 15,000 employees. And uh, this is the second time they've asked us to come back because we stand by and do quality work. Okay, have you done any studies for any cities in Palm, Beach, in Palm Beach County? Yes, over the years I've done uh, work for the town of Jupiter, uh, city of Palm Beach. Uh, we did a major study just a couple of years ago uh, for uh, Broward County. Uh, I've done work for the Key West Aqueduct Authority. Uh, I've done work for uh, Wellington, city of Wellington. Uh, in the past, so there's probably a dozen or so. But uh, nothing uh, recently. Uh, the most recent one <coughs> would be Broward County. It's not in. I know it's not in Palm Beach County, but that would be the most yeah, recent. Yeah, but also, um, state, county, and local. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Have you done any studies on uh, any of the major cities in the United States? Yes. Like Chicago, L.A., or Cleveland, New York, or Washington. Uh, I've done work for the city of Atlanta. Uh, I've done work city of Baltimore. Uh, I've done work for San Bernardino County, which is one of the largest California most counties in, in, the in, in the country. Uh, I've done work for the city of Dallas, city of Austin, Texas. Uh, I've done work for uh, no, that's good. city that's of El, El Paso. It's been somewhat universal. Yeah. Do you find it in when you make recommendations to the cities, do you find it unusual for the cities not to accept your recommendations? Is that one of pattern? The, one of one of the, our calling cards is that all of our folks are senior level people. I started my career as an HR director in a city, in city government. And so when I make a recommendation, I know by which I speak and I know and understand the lay of the land. And so I would say 98% of the time when I make a recommendation, it's followed. Uh, some t there, there are some instances when it's not. So we're in the 2%. You're in the 2%. That's not good, and that's not good at all. Um, the people on the project team, I think there's, did any of these people, I think, benefit from the salary thing that, that was on the team? Uh, on the team, under the five uh, and ten, the city manager was not in the study. Uh, so the other three individuals did benefit from the, from, from the study. Do you consider, is that usual, that people on a team that's going to help do the work actually investigate? I mean, not investigate, but actually, do you s see that? Uh, it's, it's is not that common? It's is not it unusual. Common? It's not unusual. Uh, usually you want representative of the committee that know the organization, have a strong sense of, uh, of the history in terms of salary and, and, and policy as it relates to compensation. So that's not unusual. Did you know that the, the people that were on the team would benefit yes. from be before? After I ran the analysis, sure. After you ran the analysis. Yes. And I made them aware of that. One second. I want to go back to the 2% that Riviera Beach finds itself in versus the 98%. Okay. Did, did the city of Riviera Beach tell you why they, they were not going to accept a recommendation that 98% of the people have, had accepted in the past cities? The rationale presented for the 5 and 10 implementation model was twofold. One, uh, it was stated that the city uh, had not 
um, provided raises in line with some of the neighboring jurisdictions over the years. And two, uh, that there was a desire within the organization to get the city to a more competitive point as it relates to compensation. And so that was the justification that I was given for the more aggressive model. Is that what you're usually given from the 2%? Well, it varies. It depends on circumstances of the organization. I didn't find that unusual, no. But did you accept it? Did you think that was? I still stood behind my recommendation. So your recommendation was to directly in contrast to the recommendation that the city accepted, and you stood by it anyway, right? I stood by the 10 and 20. And I do, too. Thank you. That's Madam, Madam Chair. Chair. Councilwoman, I'm sorry, Chair Pro Tem Hubbard. Sir. Yes, ma'am. You, as you stated, you recommend uh, the least aggressive for, for the 1020, which would gradually bring people up. Um, the committee, well, I won't say the entire committee, but you were told that the city wanted to become more competitive. Yes. And that's why we would take a more aggressive approach. Yes, ma'am. Who gave you that, that that idea or that directive that that was what uh, was desired? Well, during the course of the meetings, uh, the finance director was was pretty vocal. There wasn't much opposition to, you know, what the finance director was recommending, and so um, there was no uh, voice against. Uh, you know, his rationale. Uh, he indicated that the funds were there, um, and, and that's the direction that ultimately was decided to go in. So if, okay, so just to be clear, the finance director indicated that we wanted to make a, a more aggressive approach then we, um, whatever the, the formula that took us there, the five to 10, yes, that took us there in such an aggressive manner, also swept other persons up, as you can see, up, yes. uh, up into, yes. into, that, into that realm. Yeah, that so cool. I'm gonna stop now and I'm going to let you finish and then I will continue with 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 this point. Okay. Uh, I just have one or two s slides left. So that was uh, it. I, I, I do want to make uh, one or two closing points. Uh, I, I've been doing this a long time and, and I consider myself an ethical person. Um, I love local government. I think it's the only level in this country of government where you can, you can actually reach out and touch your, your elected representative and hold them accountable. If I had any inkling that someone was doing something or trying to do something inappropriate, <coughs> I would immediately stop and, 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 and signal the whistle to the parties that be that something was not afoot. I categorically do not believe that anybody on that committee had the intent to do anything that was inappropriate or wrong. It's not unusual for someone in finance who knows the financial and fiscal situation of the city uh, to have a, uh, an aggressive voice or a lead voice in that process. It's not unusual that the committee uh, at times will be made up of some members who will benefit uh, from the study. They don't know that going in, but. Uh, that is not unusual, and so sh hindsight being 2020, perhaps my advice should have been heeded, and, and, and perhaps a more conservative approach taken. But I, I want to go on record saying I don't think anybody had the intent to do anything that was inappropriate. And be that as it may, whoever sat on the committee were going to benefit one way, one way or the other, regardless of what department they would have been chosen from. It would have not, it would have been advantageous or it could have, you know, turned out to be a person that didn't um, 
they didn't get a um, increase at all. Sure. But what um, what concerns me is the fact that okay, m most of I guess most of staff, most of departments know that the person with the purse strings usually uh, call call the shots, and in in. In the in the in the in the letter from May seventh, in the presentation that you have just given us, it's clear that okay, our finance director was the lead person and chose to be the lead person in, on this committee. Two things concern me with that, because normally. The finance director does not sit on, a, on the union committee, and our finance director end up sitting on the union um, committee. The, also, these things appear to be the whole, it, all of it doesn't appear to be in uh, the best interest of the employees as a whole. What we have done so far, and this is this is what I see, because, and I want to kind of get, you know, just directly and kind of straight to the point, because I don't want to skirt around the pink, the elephant in the room, and I don't want to, and I don't want to be here all night, you know, trying to get to where we know that we are. We we have this looks like we're moving aggressively to get where we should have taken our time with the 510 so everybody could have benefited you know more harmoniously and more and there would have been more equity in the distribution of the raises or the increases then on the second hand on on the, on the other side we in our union negotiations and our transfer of funds we we're, we're changing from a more beneficial benefit package if you will that's not as beneficial to to the to the rest of the employees so it almost looks as if the council was aware that we knew these were the directions that we had given staff when 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 none of when that's further further from the truth truth so what so what i'm saying is right now what and I know uh, the council, the, the rest of the council want to weigh in. What would it, what would the impact be if we went back to the 510 recommendation 10 to, 20. 10 I'm 20. sorry, excuse me, 1020 recommendation that you made? Well, I think uh, Mr. Campbell outlined it in the cost difference. There's and that would be the only, the cost difference would be yeah, the only about thing. about $150,000. The cost difference would uh, be the difference. About one hundred and fifty. dollars it's, it's about twice as much. I did want to say one thing in uh, support of the very hard work that's been done here by the staff. Uh, we've been working actually totally over a year on this project, and I did want to say that uh, in the committee, the committee was Mr. Sherman, the finance director. It is entirely appropriate that your chief fiscal officer serve on a committee like that. Everywhere that we do implementation options, that person is asked to serve on that committee. So it's entirely appropriate. Your city manager served on that committee. The city manager was not part of the study, so could not benefit from any decision made by the committee. And then your HR, uh, representative who actually was in a transition period uh, the most junior member of the committee uh, served on the committee but uh, I, I did and this just occurred to me because I know that it's the question is okay well why did we pick 510 over 1020 and the, again that comes down to as the finance person the person holding the purse strings Mr. Sherman pushed for that he was one of the I mean, we tried to make sure that people that deserve to get some sort of benefit in terms of actual wages recognize that. He was 
a very small winner in this whole group. We put the people up there that are going to be the ones that benefited the most. They've been here a long time. Their wages were low relative to the length of service they had in their positions. This is not an unusual thing to have happen. But, you know, when you're saying, well, how, how did the city come about making this recommendation? It was very logical. You had an HR person, the finance person, who was not a big winner in this whole thing, uh, actually came out a modest adjustment, relatively speaking. I mean, it's not chump change, but, uh, and then the city manager had, as we would say, no dog in the fight. So the committee was well uh, constructed and looking at what was presented to us from our perspective that not only did the city want to have a competitive pay structure, which we did do, but they wanted to have wages that brought people with significant longevity within the city up to a fair market rate. Uh, you have a relatively small number of these managerial positions. These are basically your non-bargaining unit, uh, non-represented employees. I believe that's a fair statement. So these are also your leadership positions. These are the people who you're calling upon to make the wheels turn here. So the difference between the two is relative to the total budget of the city, a relatively small amount of money, but it did bring people. Uh, if you think about the market point being full proficiency pay and someone who's in a leadership position, who's been promoted several times within the city or holding a higher, higher level position, they're not going to spend 20 years in that job. That's, that's almost a whole career with the city. So looking at a five and 10 year implementation, even though it was aggressive, it's not unreasonable for somebody who's been 10 or more years in a, in a position to expect that they're gonna be at least at the market point or, the, or toward the range maximum. So that was all. I just wanted to clarify that uh, it, di it did not strike anybody as being untoward or inappropriate. Let, let me say this uh, for a point of clarity to what you're saying. I'm not saying that on this committee that Mr. Sherman as a finance director shouldn't have sat, but I'm saying the fact that he said on this committee and also on the bargaining committee um, leads us to a place where the objectivity is obscured for the employees. You, you see what I'm you see what I'm saying if we're talking uh, well let me tell you then the aggressive the aggressive movement on this side which would only benefit a few people you see that but if you are at the table negotiating for increases and change of plans and compressing the salaries of the employees on this side it directly affects the outcome at the end of the day. On this side, you're moving aggressively because there's only a, and there's only a small group of people that are going to benefit extremely. But yet you're at the union table and you're doing things that compress the benefit and the salaries of the employee. It does not wash in the middle. It keeps them down. That's what, I, that's, what I, that's what I'm trying to say. I'm not saying that he shouldn't have been on this committee. I'm saying he shouldn't have been on both. That's Madam, what I'm saying. Madam Chair. Councilwoman Botelli. Thank you. Chair. So I have a question about um, the difference between the managerial implementation plan and the general implementation plan. Were, were all these plans then put at a 510 implementation? All of them. And, and if the council, for example, said, let's take the management implementation plan and make it a 1020, we could, le we could leave the general plan at a 510. Can they be separated in that way is my question. If you so choose, you could. And I guess I have a question about the way this was presented to council. I was not yet on council. I remember sitting in the audience at that meeting. Kashamba was sick with the flu as I recall, and it was about a 10-minute presentation, and none of these numbers were given to council. 
no, no one on council had access, I don't believe, no. to any of this information. No. It so it seems as if this was done sort of under cover of, it was just not very transparent to me in the audience and I think to people sitting in this on this dais. I don't think people were aware of these numbers and I think that's an unfortunate that people did not have access to this from, information. From, from right. our perspective, when we do the presentation, we explain the process and the total financial impact. We do not get into individuals. Uh, now, if the organization chooses to do that internally, that's your right, but we don't uh, get in a public forum and start singling out individuals. I never I have mean, done it and this, I never This will. council back then, I think it was February, voted to implement something and, and didn't really have access to this data about who was getting what increases, I believe. And so I, th I think now that we have that information, we may want to take a closer look at how it is implemented and maybe put this on an agenda for future recommendations. That's what I have to say. Madam, Madam Chair, Councilwoman yeah. miller Anderson. Um, I have a few questions. One, I know you mentioned, and this may f be for Ms. Hoskins, that Ms. Um, Irvin has declined the assistant HR position. Yes. Okay, so now I was, I think the end of April, I did request from Ms. Hoskins the um, managerial implementation report. And the one I received was from February 18th, I believe. Um, I see in this binder for the backup, we have numerous reports, but is there a reason why we didn't get the others or, and we're just getting them now or, cause the February 18th, I think is the one that was put out there as this being the amounts that the percentages that those people increased to. And then now we're getting different variations of implementation reports. Um, showing a 510, a 1020, but that was not what was disclosed back in when I received this at the end of April. Did you have access to all of them or why did you send just the February 18th one? Because that was the one that was adopted and I provided these additional reports to show you how many times the report was ran, the okay. different variations were ran. Okay, and so from the February 18th one, um, I didn't catch your name, ma'am, I'm sorry, but I noticed you said that the city manager was not in it, but the one for February 6th, it does have her listed in the implementation report, but the one from the February 18th, she's not in that one. When we initially do the data download from the city's personnel system, it gives us everybody. Council was in there. Mm -hmm. and we so did you not just didn't back her out of the ones right, from because the she has other to days. be in there as a reviewer of subordinates mm -hmm. in order for her to be able to access the system, go online mm -hmm. and review the questionnaires of those that report to her. She had to be in the report, but once the questionnaires were done and reviewed, we went back and took her out. Okay. And so, oh, back to my question about the assistant HR. So the amount that was printed on the February 18th, which is the one you said that we accepted, was the 121,000, but in this PowerPoint today it says the 110, which is based on what? Because the previous one was based on her as the assistant uh, HR director. Okay. Now we ran it back as just an HR administrator. But a lower level classification. Okay, and but Miss Hoskins, she, I thought she bumped up to the interim HR. Is that not correct anymore? She's serving as the interim HR director. Okay. But the pay doesn't change, or is it back at the sixty? Where are we? Eighty-eight? Where? Which one is it? Sixty-five? It's a, no, it's the the middle one, I believe. The one ten. Okay, okay, so that's what the 110 is reflecting now. No, the 110 is as the um, human resources administrator. Okay, for the 510, under 510. For the 510, okay, all right. Um, now, when I looked at the meeting, I wasn't here for that meeting, but I do recall um, being a little shocked that it was pretty short. 
but I asked about the employees as a whole being aware of, because I, I, when I looked at it, when I reviewed it again, um, at that time I had a lot of conversations with numerous employees about their pay increases and blah, blah, blah. And so I asked if the employees were aware of how this was going to roll out and how people would be impacted. And um, Ms. Irvin made, said that the union did speak with their their members and um, it was pretty much unanimous that they understood it, they agreed with it, and it was kind of contrary to the people that would come to the podium because it was totally different from what was being said. And so um, I still don't see how we've, nothing has changed in between February and now. Um, other than the numbers being revealed, because during that meeting, these numbers, as um, Ms. Botel just stated, none of these numbers were presented. Now, I don't think it would make a, it, it, the importance for me is not who's getting what. I think at that time, it would have been very important for me to understand that someone was receiving a 65 or 85% raise, because that would have stood out, and I would have probably questioned that had I had those numbers in front of me, looking at it as a whole and saying it only costs, you know, $350,000 is one thing, but then to see that you have a small pocket of people receiving 50, 60, 70, 80% pay increases, that is a concern, especially when we were in the middle of negotiations for the SEIU contract. And, um, you know, there were just, you know, looking back on it, I probably would have made a, a different decision, you know, during that process knowing that this was taking place. And so this kind of came up after all of that had settled, and then all of a sudden this these numbers pop up. And so it, it just kind of put me, I felt, in a, a precarious situation because I just made a decision on something that I didn't know that's what it was gonna end up being. Um, and so I, I just, you know, I questioned the, the appropriateness, the look, as you said before, about the morale. I mean, it does not look right. I understand that they may have, most of them have been around, you know, some for nine years, um, 10, 18, 17, 11, 10. Um, we're not talking about a lot of people that have been around for 20 years and, you know, we're trying to make up for 20 years of being behind. Um, and I think I did have a conversation with Ms. Hoskins um, after these numbers did come out and she said that, you know, she was looking at adjusting them and um, trying to determine what, what amount of years would be considered the maximum. Um, and I, if I'm not mistaken, I think you said maybe 10 years would, they would be able to reach the maximum point, Ms. Hoskins? That's what? Yeah, Madam Chair, yes. yes. Based on the five, 10 year mm -hmm. um, amortization, 10 year is at maximum for the managerial is what was recommended. Right, and that was what I was having a concern with because I didn't think that really made a whole lot of sense because you don't have a, I, I don't, especially with the ranges that we were dealing with those jumps were just a little too quick for me. And so now it makes sense that that 1020 would have been most appropriate because most jobs at 20 years, you know, you pretty much are about to retire or something at that point and you reach your maximum, you cap out or something, not at 10 years. And so it didn't make a whole lot of sense to me to say that that would be the um, salary implementation that we would go along with. Um, you all mentioned about the public and the general implementation plan. Did we, wh where are those copies? Because most of these are just managerial ones. We have those as well? You no, have th everything that we Not produced. in here, you didn't right. give those to no, us. No, I didn't give you those. Okay. I'll provide the, the um, general to you. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, and I just want to ask a question. This is probably not for you per se, but it, since it came up about the finance director sitting on the 
union negotiation teams. Mm -hmm. Is this something new with Mr. Sherman being the one sitting on, or, or has this been this way for a while where the finance director sits on those? Um, he, from my experience, um, someone from finance has um, always sit on the negotiating team. Um, the issues that I believe um, that has occurred for this particular negotiating um, co no negotiating contract is that management is recommending that the benefits change, that the sick and vacation accrual be changed to PTO, and the longevity is rolled up into the salary and the employees are no longer able to um, buy back time, um, buy back the sick and vacation time. So I think those are the issues um, with the um, man current um, negotiating, te negotiating team right now. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then the cities, the municipalities that you compared, I know you kind of already touched on this a little bit when you talked about with your presentation, but I still have to say that the size of those, those municipalities just aren't very comparable to our city. Uh, you know, Palm Beach is 8,000 average, West Palm 108, thousand we're thirty five thousand Delray sixty seven Boca Raton ninety six Wellington two hundred thousand so I just if you can help me understand that I know yeah. I know you said just I, the titles I'll, I'll give you a real world example of how it's impacting the city uh, I spoke with uh, one of the leaders of the fire uh, police department this afternoon and his 15 16 years with the city he says he's never seen it fully staffed. He's got multiple vacancies now. So does the fire department. If you exclude those entities that are larger, your pay levels are going to be even lower than they are now, and you can't hire people now. So you certainly aren't going to be able to hire them in the future if you exclude the bigger entities that do have higher pay scales. You can't get around competing with the bigger entities. They're, they're your neighbors. Someone can change jobs and not have to physically relocate and uproot their family. They just change their commute. Well, I, and I, I hear what you're saying. Um, I know that we were um, dealing with our police department mm -hmm. being paid much lower than, say, Boca Raton. Um, Boca Raton, they pay much more. Our police department everyone knows they work very hard here in Riviera Beach probably 10 20 times more than those who work in in Boca Raton and so we had to try to figure out a way to be able to compensate them for the amount of work for lack of a better word that they're doing knowing that they're probably putting in more work than Boca Raton for example and so I say that on the flip side with our population, our employees um, numbers, HR for example, um, you know, we only have cl close to 400 employees where those other municipalities may have a thousand, I don't know. Um, but the workload, I just don't see how they are comparable. And I know you're saying, you know, your, your, your competition is who's around you and if you're an IT person here, you're an IT person there. But like Ms. Botel said, you know, some things just are, they are what they are, but the workload is a little different. And, and we're gonna have to agree to disagree on that, yeah. but I will uh, make one last statement. Traditionally, workload may matter to people like you and me uh, who've been in the workforce for a long time, but we've got this huge generation that's coming into the workforce called millennials they're not concerned about retirement. They're not concerned about health care. They're concerned about their paycheck, the bottom line. Most of them are coming out with $100,000, $50,000 in student loan debt. All they are c concerned about is what the job pays. They don't care about the workload. If, it, if the pay it, uh, is at a certain level. But we as, a, as you know, the elected officials and, and looking out for the city, we have to be, you know, 
financially responsible for uh, responsible the taxpayers. at the same time you got to fill the jobs too to right people. right I, and and i understand that but like i said we have to look at both ends we can't just look of course i'm sure if anybody had an opportunity they would give themselves a, a, a hundred thousand dollar raise i mean i'm an educator so believe me and you like you said people go to work every day not necessarily for their paycheck right i mean I do that almost every day, you know. So I understand not always getting paid what, you know, to match up what you do. But at the same time, if they can't afford to pay me a hundred thousand dollar increase, then that, you know, we're left up having to implement that, and we can't just implement something because that's what they they want that amount of money. And, and what, one of the things I'd advise the city may want to consider down the road is developing a compensation philosophy. And once you come up with that philosophy, post it on your website, post it on your internet so people know what you value in terms of your workforce, in terms of pay and how you see pay. And so then they can make an informed decision whether or not they want to come work for the organization. But organization this size, you should have a, a pay philosophy. Mm -hmm. of how you view pay uh, within the organization. Okay. Excuse Thank me, you. please. Riviera Beach TV 18 is now back on the air. Comcast has restored uh, cable. I wanted to interject here because um, I understand um, my colleague's position as it related to the use or consideration of the agencies that are around us. But when we looked at fire and we were looking at the cost of bringing our firefighters up to a comparable pay and trying to adjust its steps. We took into consideration Boca Raton, West Palm Beach, North Palm, Palm Beach County. We did those things looking at what was around us and I don't know that that is any different than what is typically done in a compensation study. It is not, we, I understand that they are significantly larger, but we have to look at our counterparts and what those jobs are paying. I want to also say that when we initially voted on this, there was not uh, this information. And I question, after Mr. Sherman led the team in the discussion that we would go with the more aggressive approach, then that should have come back to council so that we could have heard what the rationale from staff's perspective, because you made a recommendation of 10, 10 20. We made the decision on our side to say 5, 10, but nothing was ever brought back to this council to review or to have input. And so it is not the responsibility in my mind of the consultant to come back and to tell us we have gone with the 510, but it is a responsibility of staff to come back as opposed to getting the memorandum that talked about all of the inequities as it related to the implementation when we were fully aware on the negotiating side what was being presented. And council, in essence, was left in the blind. Because what we virtually did as a body is we blindly said, OK, get to implementation. But it should have been a return to this council to say, OK, here's, this, here's what we're asking you to implement. This is, what, this is what the outcome of that implementation will be and what it should look like. We, should, we, we shouldn't have. Not, we should not have gotten the information after the fact, but we should have had an idea of if you're saying implementation, and I'm, I don't know if there was a decision made prior to the item requesting permission to implement if that decision to go 510 had been made, because that's something that staff should have made us aware of. And that's, you know, that's not your issue, and I'm talking to staff, because that is where the rubber really meets the road. Because you, we pay you to produce a product, you produce that product, you give a recommendation, staff goes contrary to the recommendation, and then we have this statement to make it appear as if something has been done improperly. And that's where the heartburn comes in, and that's what has the constituents and our citizens upset because there is this report that, you know, we've done these massive increases and there was no conversation or discussion by this body. So that's, for me, where the real issue has come into play. Madam Chair. 
city manager. When the item was presented to you in February, February 21st, that was what was presented, the five and 10 year, that, that, that same dollar amount, 358,000. Now I, yes, it was, it was presented. Now I know mistakes were made, we should have given you the details and provided additional information, but we were trying to stick with the schedule and me not um, consulting with you know each of you about uh, the particular what employees were getting what, I realized mistakes were made. Yes, you're right, mistakes were made. But that was what was recommended at the February 21st meeting. Just that dollar the, value was, was The dollar was value and the five and 10 year. I don't recall that. I do too. Councilman Davis, you recognize. Thank you so much. I want to say to the, um, the team that came today, um, thank you for being very professional and telling the truth. Um, just like a lot of my colleagues said tonight, um, that it's very important that we do what we tried to do to award all our employees. For those who have not been following the issues, back in July and August, this board started having discussion about this study. During the discussion of the study, at that time, the city manager at that time told, it's my understanding, told this board it will not have no implication on the negotiations. And that was very important because it came up from numerous co my colleagues. And that's been one of the biggest pushes in the entire city about making sure we get our general employees paid first. This is why it's very important to have open communication with all your politicians because the news will never tell you that. Our job is to make sure to follow down the line, these are the facts. There was information withheld. And when it was withheld, somebody sent this to the news. And you, this entire city, everyone, employees, people who live here, business owners, all were impacted. As if something was wrong with our city manager, if something was wrong with our team, nothing was wrong with them. You heard the professional say tonight, what they did was nothing wrong with what they did. He stated that. This city somehow needs healing with allowing staff to do their job and allow the truth to come out and work with one another. That's the city. And somewhere down the line, this city need a major apology. This city, not me, not the council, but you, the people. And, if, and someone should be fighting for you to be treated fairly across this county. They said that Riviera Beach was doing something illegal, something wrong. Look at this. If someone worked for 10 and 20 years and gave this city a serious commitment and we were trying to do the right thing, there's nothing wrong with trying to do the right thing. There's nothing wrong with that. We were trying to reward employees. ORG, a letter went to the ORG, a, a complaint. That's not fair. The letter went to ORG as if she did something wrong. That's not appropriate. Okay, I just want to say, please allow staff to do their jobs. Please work with staff. Please give us all the information so that we can make the proper decisions and move this city in the right direction. Um, when we implemented this study, we all had one thing in common. We want to make sure one, we got the employees up to where they wanted to be because we were talking about the fire, like the chairperson was saying. We were talking about the police. We were talking about our general employees. The contract had just expired in October, but we wanted to get this done before October. This started back in July. There's a series of things that are going on in the city where people's working strong and hard together to get some things done. But I hoped that when people come and start talking about this city, that you tell them and I'm talking about the press, 
that please get the facts and allow people to do our, their job. Because what happened over here in the last few, few, few weeks with this story was almost criminal to this entire city. And it really hurts to walk around this county and have folks talk about your city when someone deliberately withheld information, sent it out to the news, and said we did something wrong. We. And we sat here and we approved the study with the information. We, okay, we didn't have who was getting what, but we was trying to do the right thing. And I think everybody was on one accord with that. Madam Manager, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Madam Chair. And, and the sorry. one last thing, oh, the longevity was a benefit, and it's still a benefit. Our employees' benefits have been under attack for a long time, and we must stop taking from them of what they earn, and don't allow no one else to try and take their benefits of something they earn. No one in this city, and no one from outside this city. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Councilwoman Botel, you recognize? I, I think we will have an opportunity to correct this wrong going forward. I think we all agree that we were not fully informed. I think we have consensus about that, it seems to me. I believe there's consensus, yeah. And so I think going forward, we can take a look at switching this from a 510 to a 1020, perhaps, and making this right. I think that the community will be we will be seen in a much better light. We might correct the appearance of impropriety when we take a look at these salaries of those people who were on this team to make these decisions and, and adjust them accordingly. So that will be my recommendation. I think that we'll have a, we'll, we may even have a unanimous vote on that, which would be a, a nice thing to see. So mm -hmm. I think we can probably call this meeting to a, a quick conclusion. Oh, uh, Madam Ms. Chair, Hope. one moment. Uh, Mr. Mayor and the City Manager. Just clarification, is there, okay. is there something that you want me to bring back for the, what is it, June 20th meeting um, in a resolution or? I what think is your we've heard direction? that we would like to see it go to a 1020 to have the implementation of the study go to 1020. That's what I believe I heard colleagues say. Yes. Um, that in addition to the fact that The impact that the PTO is going, that's, I think that we need to drop that as well because having the PTO, the resident, I mean, excuse me, the employees lose a major amount of benefits that, that they have. And we have got to, we need, and, and one thing we need to bring back is if we go back to the regu our regular benefit package, including longevity, in, lieu of, in the buyout, in lieu of the PTO, and we go back, we need to see what's the financial impact that that's going to have on, um, on the city. It's easier for us to do it all in one. It's easier, I think, it's easier for us to make that change, go back to where we were, not to try to take the longevity from the employees, not to say that they can't buy back any of their in accumulated time. And at the same time, I think we move into the 1020 as was recommended for, um, for the city. The other thing that I, I want to say is that it still concerns me that when we were recommended the 1020 and the company was forced to run it 12 times over and over to get a desired result, there's something wrong with that. Even though staff, you got a group of staff people that got an that got an increase. I'm concerned with the fact that the company was forced to run it over and over and over. I'm not, con I'm not concerned with the who got the increase. Somebody was going to get an increase and somebody wasn't. But what I'm saying, if it was implied, if, if the formula was applied as recommended and fair and equitable, it would have then, not, it, it, it wouldn't have caught up that particular managerial, managerial group. Somebody was going to be caught up, 
but it, it wasn't going to be at, a, at, at that massive rate. And I think that, that the intent behind that, that's what's wrong, and I think that we're trying to um, get around it, and we're trying to skate around it, and I think that that's wrong. Madam Chair, it's back to me. Thank you. Um, sir, you can come back. I'm, I'm, I'm not done with this for me. Mr. Russell. Mr. Russell. Hi, how are you? I've got a couple of things. Um, any of your studies, do you ever have a performance clause included? Performance clause relative to the firm's performance. Yes, to uh, to to the uh, the ten five ten ten twenty. It almost sounds like prison terms. Five <laughs> ten ten twenty. I can't <laughs> recall the one, sir. <laughs> okay, and also, do you have a model that you've seen that somewhere would have been in between seven to fifteen years that could have benefited everyone? <coughs> well. W there was a benefit to uh, every employees in that they did get the general 3% cost of living adjustment. Uh, and that was applied before the study recommendations were applied. But I mean, as far as the study, have, it, has there been a model that uh, has had s something that would have benefited the employees greater than 3% that would have been more in, in step with these the raises. Those decisions are, are, are strictly, again, tied to philosophy and fiscal resources. Is, is that why that you recommended that we would adopt some kind of philosophy? And you yes. said that earlier. Yes. Okay. And Can, yes, of course. Yeah. Um, now, when we implemented the 1020 for general, there were quite a few employees that did not receive an increase, so we added the, 3%. went back and added the 3%, and then um, it went down to like what five employees that didn't get that wouldn't get anything because they were already over the max. Thank you. And looking back retrospectively at this entire situation, and um, I don't think it takes a rocket science degree to figure out that something went wrong and it's very wrong. But do you see anything that you think is unfair? about this I stand behind my 1020 recommendation okay well that's where we're going do you have as being the the expert in this field and none of us are because you know we there was mistakes that were made uh, you did a, you know you did the best you could you, you're just, not just because I have a briefcase doesn't mean I'm the expert. I, I'm <laughs> 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 but um, based on your experience which none of us have, uh, our expertise, which none of us have, or maybe some, maybe they do, I don't know, I don't. Um, do you have any other recommendations that you feel that we could benefit from? Or Not at this time, sir. Could you, would you think about that and, and maybe send us something that you, after, after I, looking I, at all I the pieces will. of this moving puzzle? Yes, I'd be happy to do that. Okay. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. No, no, no. I want, I want to ask you something. I'm, I think I'm done with you, Ms. Russell. Madam Chair, I, I, it just seems like to me, in the spirit of fairness, um, I definitely would like to hear from Mr. Sherman, the finance director. His name has been mentioned a few times tonight. Uh, he had, it uh, seems, a dominant role on um, a couple of these committees. And I just think that, in fairness, that I, I want to hear from the finance director. I don't want to hear from about the finance director in the media or anywhere else. But I need to hear from him directly. That's just me. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I, I honor. I, I, I would like for that request yeah. to be honored. I would like to hear from him as well. Mr. Mr. Sherman, would you come up? What would you like to hear specifically, Mr. Mayor? I would like to hear what his role was and what he told them. 
and uh, there has been some accusation that you reported something to the press. I want to hear that. I want to hear whatever you have to say tonight to, uh, to clarify things that, that may have been reported that one of my colleagues said was reported in the meeting. Whatever you think you need to say, I need to hear it because I haven't heard directly or indirectly from you. Good. Thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing that um, Good opportunity. Good evening, Rand Randy Sherman, Director of Finance. Um, yeah, what, what has not been said tonight um, is that I actually push for a much more aggressive plan for the general employees as well. Um, th unfortunately, there's nobody that was at the negotiating table here from the general employees, at least I haven't, I haven't seen anybody. Um, but they actually, general employees actually came in and asked for a similar type plan uh, with a 30-year amortization. Um, city ultimately settled on a 20-year amortization, um, but I was actually pushing for a 15-year amortization. Um, I don't think that 20 was aggressive enough for the general employees. Um, we never, I don't believe, and maybe Ms. Irvin can correct me, um, at the table actually offered a 15. I know we talked about it, um, you know, when we, you know, stepped aside and, you know, and, and had our, our private comments. Um, but I think that we were looking at a seven-year 15 for the general employees. And you have to remember that when we did the police officers, and I would hope that Chief Madden would, would back me on this, and when we did the firefighters, and I hope Chief Durham would back me on this, we actually took two steps off of both of their pay plans. Their jobs, uh, their pay scales actually amortize over a seven-year period. Um, not 10, not 20, not 15, uh, seven. Um, and the reason that we pushed for a more aggressive plan, and you know, I know probably don't want to make this meeting any longer than it needs to be, but if you look at police officers and you look at police sergeants, um, they're, the sergeants are overlapping the captains. Um, and sergeants get overtime. Um, and if you don't amortize the captains and the majors appropriately, there's no reason for anybody to step up from being a sergeant. You know, so there was not only the compression issues that Mr. Campbell mentioned, but we also had issues within the pay scale because police and fire were outside of this study. Now they were looked at, but again, those two contracts were negotiated separately. Um, so you're right, you know, I, I think Mr. Campbell said, well, he knew the lay of the land. I'm, I'm not sure he knew it all. Um, because again, if, if you really want to know the truth of it, the plan that we were pushing, I actually take a pay cut. Because by giving up the buyback, that more than offsets the, the minimal raise that came out as part of the compensation study. So again, you have to have the, the full picture here. Um, what we were seeing and the reason that we ran um, so many uh, variations um, is because we were sitting in conference rooms or we were sitting on the phone um, and it was, well, what if we do this? What if we do that? My main concern all along was the bottom line. Could we afford it? And if you actually go back to last year's budget meetings, um, we thought it was actually going to be a two-year implementation, that we would have to take a half a step and then finish the, the second half a step. The numbers came back um, much lower than we had anticipated. Uh, and we were able to actually push to get it all done in the first year. There was no reason to make the employees who had furlough days, who went years without raises, wait any longer. And there was, you know, we were pushing to get it done on April 1st and get everybody where they truly needed to be. Um, so again, you can say what you want. Um, as far as Mr. Davis, um, the interesting thing, and I don't know how, uh, because when I was looking at these issues, I had a very, very, very small circle. I obviously needed people to be able to help me get information. 
Um, the interesting thing was, um, and I don't know the specific date, uh, Monday the 30th or something, I would say within 10 minutes of each other, I received a call both from the Post and from WPTV asking for a copy of the letter. And I told them, you know, I was looking at things. I hadn't made any decisions. There were no letters. We were still investigating. Uh, but when you get a public records request, you respond to a public records request. I, however, was not the person who sent it out citywide. Uh, my intent always was just to send it to the mayor and council. So how it became public knowledge, I have no idea. Um, so if you want to blame me for sending it to the press, I sent it to the press upon their request. Um, I think it's a uh, you know, violation if I don't respond to a public records request. Um, neither one of them uh, actually followed up, I don't believe, and asked any subsequent questions. Um, but you know, that, that was the responsibility. I just, Madam have one, I, Madam. I just have one question. One moment. To finish. One moment, Mr. Mayor. Yes. Madam City Manager. As it relates to the police and fire, uh, the captains and the compression, we did meet with Mr. Russell and Ms. Long today to talk about how we're going to address the compression issues with the captains and the sergeants and the assistant chiefs. So that's not something that right. you know we we're not going to address. Okay, Mr. Sherman, as you said, as, as was said earlier, several mistakes were made. Let me ask you this one question, mm -hmm. longevity. Yes. Um, I, I heard, and I don't know, that the police had longevity at one time and it was taken away. Police, uh, ha police haven't had longevity probably in 14, 15 years. Um, Ms. Hoskins, do you remember exactly? It was like 04, somewhere around there that it went away? I'm not sure. Yeah. Can you tell me why some have longevity and others do not? It, well, again, I wasn't here in 04 and 05, but I believe, you know, I'm again, either. during negotiations, they gave up longevity for, you know, for so either some other um, issue in their contract, and my guess is it was probably salary. So the police department just gave up the longevity. They gave up longevity and several years ago, again, I believe it was before I, I arrived, um, SCIU and PMSA both went to a dollar amount, not a percentage amount. And the firefighters, uh, the fourth union, agreed that they would give up longevity when management gave up longevity. So back to, uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and you know, and that was four years ago, and that that ordinance has never been brought forward to take it away from management. Okay. And then once it take it goes away from management, it would go away for fire as so new basically the police department the fire voluntarily gave up their longevity thing. Correct. Thank you, sir. That's Madam it for Chair. me, Madam Chair. Just a point of clarity, I never stated a name on who called the press. I said someone called the press and someone s submitted it to the OIG. Never stated a name. Mr. Um, Sherman, what, what doesn't make any sense to me is that, okay, if you were advocating for a higher pace, um, a more aggressive pace for the general employees, how would it then benefit them if we put them on the PTO um, plan and they were losing things that they uh, had enjoyed for, for quite a while? Yeah, the, the, the PTO plan um, doesn't really have anything to do with the compensation study. Yes, yes it's a, a combined package and yes there's some savings to the city, but the issue that the state legislature did to your employees back in 2011 is they took away the huge lump sum separation payments. So accruing all of those benefits where employees used to accrue 900 hours when they got retired, doesn't do the employees any good anymore. They can't get those payments paid to them uh, when they retire. The state did away with that. With so the cap. With, so well, they, they capped what you had on the books back in 2011, 
But anything after that, you can't get. So all your new employees coming in, they're getting nothing in that regard. Madam so Chair, you mean pensionable. It won't be pensionable, but we can still pay it out. You only pay it out on separation. You don't pay it out on retirement. So when they go into retirement, okay, those large benefits don't do them any good. So the, the issue was is, again, because the employees were accruing this, they weren't using the days. And then what they were doing is when they're not using sick days, they're losing them altogether. So when we converted the sick days to PTO days, it actually gave the employees the opportunity to use those days as they saw fit. Because again, the payouts were being, were being limited. And, and, and Mr. Um, Sherman, I get that, but what I'm saying to you is even if they capped out at a certain amount, they still had the opportunity or the option to say buy, buy them back in December. A lot of employees noted that in December, that's when they would um, cash in some of their time. Okay. Yep. And that's and and that's what they had saved it for. So that is a benefit, and so, that's an option, and that's a choice. Now, with what the state legislature had put in that was affecting the new employees, that's something that we could not have done anything right. about. And and we're clear with that because we're not here to 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 break the law. But what we're saying is, if you're telling all these people that have put in all this time that have accrued this time because they know that they wanted to cash in a uh, piece of it. Some of them wanted to take um, some at retirement. And as you said, they, that some can only take it at separation and a lot of it is not pensionable. But those are the accumulation that they have, they have done. I don't ever remember anyone bringing to us an option for general employees for the uh, for the 15 for for the 50, the 715 uh, no aggressive the, no the the team I think is Mr. Campbell kept referring to it um, ultimately said no what was that called Randy the what the seven year for the 15 year what was the cost? I, don't, I don't have one of those runs in front of me but yeah, you know, we, we did, we ran 715. Mr. Campbell, do you have the calls? Uh, no. Uh, we have them, we have them in here. I'll look at, I'll, I'll, I'll look, look that one up. And but let me, let me go back to the buyback for a minute. When you get, the maximum you can buy back is 80 hours. So that's two weeks, which is a little bit less than 4% of your pay. Um, when we were offering the general employees, even with the 1020 and not necessarily the aggressive uh, or more aggressive package, um, the average was 11 percent. Um, and when, you know, if you actually sit down and look at look at the pay and look at the way that the compensation plan runs, you are actually better with the compensation plan um, and then not getting the buyback. Uh, over time, it works out to the employee's benefit uh, by implementing the compensation plan. So again, to partial to pay for the compensation plan is getting the buybacks. Doesn't impact all the employees. Um, and obviously, you know, if you think about it, the, the biggest winners are, are the management team. Um, you know, we, we don't get all our time off when, when, you know, as we work through the year, and it's the higher salary. So when they get, you know, management team gets eight, 80 hours, uh, you know, if you actually look at, at who gets the comp or the buybacks and who doesn't, um, it's not necessarily the general employees. There's actually very few of them that, that are giving up anything uh, to be able to get that compensation plan. You know, the last three-year contract that we entered with SCAU um, was about $1.4 million over three years. The plan that we offered to SEIU this time was $4.2 million mm -hmm. over three years. I mean, it was a very lucrative plan that we offered. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is, and we'll go back to the table. And um, again, I, I still think the 715 is the better plan for them, but we'll, we'll see what happens. Yeah, well, 
the the only thing about the 715 it was never uh it was never brought up at it as an option and it's uh and 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 this is the first that that we are here that we're hearing of it we saw the 510 you had an opportunity that night to say that you wanted to that that um you advocated for the um for the 715 yes it would have been a little more aggressive than the um than the 5 uh, 10 but at least that you would have you we would have saw that for everybody and would it be less horrendous for a group of people that basically got swept into it because you decided to go with the five that you decided to go with the uh, with the 510 as opposed to the recommended 1020 and then on top of that some of the comments and I and I wrote down my comments from some of the uh, employees that was interested from the SEI union and one of and one of the things that that they were concerned about is the sick and vacation time for the PTO mm -hmm. and that seemed to be very important so I so definitely when we go back to the negotiation table we need to see how that dollar wise if they go to 715 and the sick and vacation well how will they benefit or how will it not benefit them because I have you know like a list of eight things that was important to the SEIU uh, family and that was that was a, a, a big concern yeah and, and I know we really don't want to negotiate in public but you know you know when we left that that day from the, the last negotiations we had with SEIU everyone at that table understood what they, what had been agreed upon and they were they were happy there was not there was not another SEIU contract that they probably could find in the state that was um, you know as, had as much value in it as, as to what this city was offering but you're right I, I don't disagree with that we go back and and see where we go. Good. Any questions, comments, or questions for Mr. Chairman? Thank you, okay. Mr. Chairman. So, Madam City Manager, you will bring back um, an item for discussion with regards to the implementation of the plan at uh, 1020. Yes, ma'am. In addition to the um, information with regards to PTO, buyback, and longevity. Okay, there being no further business, we stand adjourned.